I bet uh, all of you have either witnessed something like that or you have been involved in something like we just watched together. Maybe you're like me and you're scrolling through your feed and you saw someone you knew, family member, friend, and they shared an opinion and you immediately engaged in an argument with them. Now, maybe you, again, are like me and you typed out a whole comment and you, you then were smart enough to erase it and you didn't actually go into the argument, but in your head. Or maybe it was during the holidays and you were at a, a dinner with your family and you found out that somebody in your family listens to the wrong news network, you know, the one you don't like, and you thought to yourself, come on, man, you're, you're smarter than that. And either you said something or you didn't say anything, but one thing's for sure, you thought about them differently than you thought about them before. And there are some people you know that you just, you can't listen to them. When they start talking about certain things, you just have to get away from them. You can't be around them. And they may be short on information, but they aren't short on opinions. And they may not have all the facts, but they sure do have all the answers. And if if leaders of our country would just give you an hour of undivided attention and a commitment to do what you told them to do, oh man, things would be a whole lot different. Now, maybe things have always been that way in, in our country, and probably to some ways they have, but almost all of us, almost everywhere I go, people feel like the strain in our culture is deeper than it's ever been, and that there are things we just can't talk about, it seems, anymore, that we're at a place where the divide is deeper and bigger than it's ever been. I know of several families, not just one or two, but several families in our church that their adult children, they couldn't be together at Christmas because of these kind of, of things. It's like everybody's listening for trigger words and people of all ages are listening to put people in camps and to divide people into camps. And once they're in that camp, you just think about them differently. I mean, you handle them differently. In fact, if you're new to Community Christian, uh, we're really glad you came to be a part of this today, but maybe you're new to church or you've been around some Christians and you think Christians think one way and, and you're good with that or others of you, you know how Christians think and you're not good with that. And one of the things that you're trying to figure out is where do we stand on this? In fact, uh, many of you who have been around Christian, uh, Community Christian for a while, you might find this interesting to know that People are always trying to figure out, is Community Christian a left-wing church or are they a right-wing church? And the truth is, we're for the whole bird. We, we like both wings. In, in fact, it, it might surprise you, again, if you're new, that normally at Community Christian, we don't talk about these kind of cultural things or political things for sure. Now, occasionally we'll talk about issues that are in the Bible that other people think are political, but... We typically don't raise these kind of political issues like maybe other churches do because we believe we have something way more important to do than that. But occasionally throughout the history of God's people, people who've had to stand up and talk like me, pastors, people who are deciding what to say to the people of God, they notice something in our culture, in the culture they're addressing, that it comes to a point where they just feel like they have to say something. And this year, when we were trying to figure out how would we start 2018, and we were, as a team, brainstorming what were the things in our church that we were seeing, what were, what were families struggling with, what were we seeing people have arguments about, about tension about, about anxiety about, when we began to think about what the topic should be, this current divide that exists in our culture, it felt like that if we did not address it, that we might become a bigger part of the problem, instead of being what... The church was intended to be when Jesus originally set it up. Now, you might not know this, but when Jesus originally was telling his followers what his kingdom, what his followers would look like, this was his description. He said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus' desire for his followers has always been that no matter what the culture was doing, no matter what was happening politically, that we would do life, that our lives would be lived in such a way that people would see 
the good that God had put inside of us in contrast to the darkness that was around, and they would, it would give light to the whole culture, and they would give glory to our Father in heaven. So to start this year, in this series over the next few weeks, we're going to talk to you about some characteristics of what it means to live as the light of the world, what it means to live as a city set on a hill, giving light to the whole thing. That we, we believe these are characteristics that the Bible teaches that followers of Christ should do for everyone, always, that we should do for all people in all circumstances. And we want to look at these characteristics. These are things that are true of followers of Christ. And it should be true in all circumstances, with everyone, at all times. Now, if you're here and you're not uh, yet a follower of Christ, or you just came because somebody invited you, uh, these are things that for you, they're really optional. But the good news for you is that you can listen in now, and you can hear not just what's optional for Christians, but for followers of Christ, this is what is expected of us. And when you see us go against it, well, you can point it out to us and, and help us get it back on track. Because of the nature of the divide that we have that exists in our culture, we believe that if followers of Christ, if, if we would begin to live this way, we would, really would become like a city on a hill. We would become like a light in dark place. If we would consistently live this way with everyone always, that people really would see the difference that the church would make, and we could begin to bridge the divide that exists in our culture. So I want to start this by... I want to take you to a very famous saying of Jesus. In fact, this is one of the sayings of Jesus that has made its way outside followers of Christ. Almost everyone knows this particular saying. He, he says this just a few moments after he says the thing about light of the world, the city set on a hill. He says, In everything, treat others as you want them to treat you, for this fulfills the law and the prophets. Now, that's commonly been known as the golden rule. And that last part of what he, he's saying is he just says, this fulfills everything God wants from you, the law and all the prophets. If you would just treat other people the way you want to be treated. But the real question is, to apply this statement to Jesus, I have to first ask myself a question. I have to ask myself, how do I really want to be treated by others in every situation? Have you... Have you ever asked yourself that? I mean, seriously? Have you ever sat down and thought to yourself, I mean, really intentionally, how is it I want everyone in all situations, whether it's my neighbor or my spouse or people in my family or my coworker or people who share my beliefs or people who don't share my beliefs, how is it I want to be treated by everyone in every situation? Well, the truth is I had never really asked myself that question, not in any really thoughtful adult kind of way. So as a part of this, that's what I did. And what I came up with is that for me, what I want from people is that I want everyone to treat me with respect, that I, I want to be treated with respect, and I want, I want to be given grace. And what I mean by that is I, I want everybody who, who interacts with me, I would like them to respect me as a human being. I'd like them to not speak down to me. I would like them to look at me as a full person, and when they look at me, I'd like them to to know that I'm a person that's going to make mistakes and that I'm not going to get everything right. And so, therefore, when they see it, I'm going to need them to give me some grace. I'm going to need them to treat me with respect. That's what I would like. And I'd like them to give me grace when I mess up in those situations. My guess is many of you probably aren't that very different. But the idea that Jesus gets at is what I want other people to do for me, I should be willing to do for every person in all situations. Jesus and his followers eventually go on to a, a higher standard than that for followers of Christ. He says, not just you treat people the way that you want to be treated. He says, you treat people the way that God has treated you. And of course, God treats us with respect. He doesn't force himself on us. He, he treats us with respect. He respects our boundaries until he allows us to come to him in faith. And he gives us grace when we mess up. Now, Many respect basically means that I, tr I treat people with, with high regard. I look at every person and I treat them with high regard. It means that I value other people and I treat them as being valuable. It, it, that's what Jesus is asking us to do in Jesus' command when he says to treat every single person I meet, I treat them as valuable. I give them high regard. Now, that seems really clear to me. 
but maybe you think there's some wiggle room in there. Well, as time went on, the followers of Jesus began to expand on this and to talk about it in clearer details as they tried to help people apply it. One of the followers of Jesus, some people would say the closest follower of Jesus, a guy named Peter who was known for being direct, he says it this way. He says, show respect to everyone. Now, Peter's making clear, this isn't a suggestion. This isn't it you think about it. This is a command for followers of Christ. Show respect to everyone. Now, again, that seems really, really clear to me. Show respect to everyone always. Not a lot of wiggle room there. And not a lot that is requiring of commentary by me. So I could just end this first message right there on Show respect to everyone always. And it would be a memorable message at this point because I would end so early. But I know how so many of you, you know, you wait all week to get a chance to hear me talk and you'd be disappointed if I ended now, so I won't. And then, of course, the other side of this is, as I thought about it a little bit, it's not just the command. It's not the idea that I should show respect. What I should do is really clear. The problem that most of us have, I, I'll rephrase that, the... the I guess the problem that I have is not what should I do, it's how should I do it? I mean, when it comes to, I mean, of all the people in the world, of all the people in the world that don't show me respect, and all the people in the world that do things that are just stupid to me, of all the people that don't act the right way, that don't believe the right things, that don't do the right things, that aren't of the same mind that I am, that behave in ways that are disrespectful toward me, how do I show respect to everyone always? Isn't that the problem? How to do it, not what to do? How do I show respect to people? And the truth is, it doesn't come natural to anyone. I mean, it's not like human beings are born as little lights, beacons of, of respect factories. I mean, when, when you come out of the womb and the health professional who gives you life hits you on the backside to make you breathe breath into your lungs, you don't turn to them and lovingly coo at them, thanking them for allowing you to live. Instead, you scream like somebody ought to call defects. I mean, the whole growing up time, nobody looks at their brothers and sisters and respects their things. We try to steal their candy and take their toys every time that we think we can get away with it. There's no one who's really honest that could say, you know, the whole time I was a teenager, I treated my mom and dad, I treated other people, I treated my coaches with respect when I was with them, and when I wasn't, I was always respectful. The point is, human beings have to be taught to respect. We have to learn how to show respect to each other. And one of the things that appears to have been lost in our culture as this divide has gotten deeper is that adults have lost the ability to show respect to other people. We've forgotten how to do this. So in the time that I have remained, what I want to do is something that I don't often do. I, 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 I read on this. I have prayed about this. I've listened to other people talk about this. And what I have is I want to give you a list of how I believe followers of Christ can go about showing respect to everyone always. I don't do a whole lot of lists when I teach. Some of you will love this. Others of you will go, well, that was really weird. But I want to give you a list of some ways that we can show respect to everyone always. This is practically how to do it. First, and in some ways this first thing that I bring up to you, it's like a foundation for all the rest. In fact, this idea, this first one is is really a foundation for this whole series we're going to talk to. First, I have to make it clear in my mind that every person who crosses my path is made in the image of God. Every person is an image bearer of our great God. Those of you who have been around Community Christian for some time, in fact, long-term Community Christian people will tell you that that from the earliest days, I've been looking, we've been looking at each other, and I've been saying to people, you'll never lock eyes with someone for whom Christ does not love them. You've never met someone. You've never disagreed with someone. You've never been around someone that our great God did not willingly give up the life of his son for. Our great God, he loves the worst person in this world, better than you love anyone in this world. 
Our God looks at every single person and he knows they were stamped with his thumbprint. Every single human being that I cross paths with, the people that I disagree with, the people who don't believe like me, people in other countries that are against me, people who don't have my values, our great God th- st- put his thumbprint on the life and soul of every one of them. I'm convinced that if I am ever going to show respect to everyone always, I have to get this crystal clear in my mind. I'm convinced in the times that I, I mess up on this, it's because this value slips a little bit in my mind. And I'm convinced that if you and I as followers of Christ are going to bridge the divide that is growing in our culture, you and I are going to have to be clear that every single person you meet is an image bearer of our great God. You know... Our great God only treasures one thing in this world. It's people. And he treasures every one of them. He looks at every one of them as somebody who was made in his image, someone for whom his son died. And he asked followers of his to show respect to every one of them in every situation. This single bedrock truth is the foundation of learning how to respect Everyone, always. And once we get that tattooed on our heart and mind, it becomes easier to treat people who I disagree with as someone who is high value because they, too, are made in the image of God. They have great value to our great God. How are you doing with regard to this? With everyone, always. The second thing is respectful people learn how to disagree with people without demonizing them. Respectful people learn we can have spirited debates with other people without having to draw blood from them. We can dislike another person's opinion. We can dislike their position. We can dislike their behavior and the way that they treat other people without having to dislike the other person or to treat them as if they have no value. But let me just say, this trait being able to disagree with people without having to draw blood from them, this is a learned behavior. And it seems like this is a behavior that our culture has been losing the ability to, to give to each other. And the result is this growing divide in our country over, well, over everything, it seems. We spew disrespect out toward each other over issues that it seems like we ought to be able to talk about. In fact, if we're ever going to make progress, we're going to have to talk about. And this is where I believe Christians have to lead the way on this. Or, I mean, the long-term effects of what's going on in our culture, the current trajectory of our culture has a way darker path than most of us, I think, realize. In my trying to to learn about this, I, I, I read about one guy who talked about being in a place at watching former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, who served uh, at the highest levels of our government over a long period of time when this growing political divide in our country has come to its worst point. He talks about at one point watching her in a debate with two people who were really opposed to her at almost every point. Every time that they would begin to speak, they would start out respectfully enough, but eventually they would get to the point that they would begin to demonize her personally, that they would begin not just to talk about her positions on issues, but they would talk about her personally and tear her down personally, that they would go to the place that it it became to feel more like a personal attack than it did about positions that she was taking. They said, but every time they were amazed when it came Condoleezza Rice's uh, opportunity to speak, She would draw a breath, and then she would say, Gentlemen, with all due respect, and then she would make her point. And the guy who was writing said, and it wasn't like that was just a phrase she used. She did go forward, and she disagreed with them on their policies, but she did it with all due respect. Later, when he had a chance to talk to her, he noted this little phrase to her that she had used, and she laughed and said to him, you know, actually, that's... That's like my two-second prayer. It's to remind me that I need to give all due respect because these people, too, are made in the image of our God, which we just talked about. These people, too, des- deserve my respect, even though I disagree with them. I use it as a two-second prayer. When I read that, I thought, 
Well, there's something practically we could all learn. We could begin to use that, not just as something we'd say, but in a moment when you're in a conversation and somebody says something that you really disagree with and everything in you begins to rise up before you begin to say something back, maybe you say out loud, maybe you don't have to, maybe you draw your breath and you just say it to yourself, with all due respect to, to you as a person made in the image of God, with all due respect, and then you make your point. Maybe when you see somebody post a meme that just infuriates you or makes fun of somebody that you respect before you blast off something on social media. Again, maybe you either start your comment or you say to yourself, with all due respect, and I remind myself that they deserve my respect. In your interactions with people at work, in your interactions with people who disagree with you, in your interactions with your family and friends, maybe you need to have that little prayer on your lips with, with all due respect. And it'll remind us to treat everyone always with the respect that they are due and not get caught up in the heat of the moment. I read that and I thought, that's something I practically need to learn. My point here is, again, is that we all have to learn and we have to have practical ways to train ourselves to grow into people who respect everyone always. And I assure you, I think that with proper training, we can become people who disagree with other people. And we can disagree on the points that they're trying to make. But we don't have to be disagreeable and we don't have to dislike the other person. You can disagree without drawing blood. We can show due respect and we can begin to bridge the divide in our culture. Third, respectful people discipline themselves to believe the best about the other person. Maybe you didn't know, and maybe you never heard this, or maybe just because you see so much that goes against this. Followers of Christ, there is actually a bedrock teaching of Jesus that lies at the, at the, at the foundation of all Christian behavior. He said, people will know that you're my followers, by the way, that you love one another. Just so we don't get fuzzy on this, most of the writings in, in the New Testament are just ways to live out this command of how we love each other in the church, outside the church. How do we live out a life of love? One of the most prominent followers of Jesus, a guy named Paul who writes so much of the New Testament, expanding on this. At one point, he writes one of the most classic passages of literature. In fact, it's become so classic, lots of people have it read at their wedding, and they don't even know it comes out of the Bible. It's really not about weddings. It's about how we are to treat one another. Paul, at one point, he gets to the end of it, and at the end of it, he basically is going to talk to us about believing the best about each other. Let me read to you this passage most of you will have heard. He says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily anger. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Boy, that'd be a big help in your disagreements in your family or at work. If, I mean, many of us know what it's like to live, live with a file keeper. Well, let me see here. Back in December 17th, 1999, you said. I mean, it's hard to make much progress relationally with somebody who's keeping a file on everything that you did that was wrong. Now look at the next part. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. You know what that means? Love isn't walking around hoping that the person you disagree with will slip up and you'll see something wrong so that you can point it out. Love is not looking for evil. Love is not looking for wrong. Love is waiting to catch the other person doing right. Paul says, when you're walking around looking for wrong, that's not love. Love wants to find other people doing right. And then he says, as if just to expand on that, he says this, love, it always protects always love it always trust always always hopes always perseveres now if that sounds extreme to you and you'd say paul that's so extreme i think paul would say oh good you understood it is extreme love always leans in love is always bending 
Love is always leaning toward the other person. Love is always looking for the opportunity to give the other person the benefit of the doubt. It's always looking to protect the relationship. It's always leaning to find something right. It, it's always doing the work. Love is doing the work. Love is always trusting. I'm going to do everything I can to try to trust you. I won't give up. It always perseveres. Love is always there. Paul is saying, love gives the other person the benefit of the doubt. When there's a difference between what I promised you and what I delivered, when I said one thing and I did another thing, love gives the person the benefit of the doubt. Love is looking for the most generous explanation for why I didn't come through. Love is looking for the most reasonable, the most generous explanation. Love gives the other person way beyond the benefit of the doubt. It's looking for every other reason other than distrusting the person. And it chooses trust over suspicion. And then he goes right back, and this part goes right back, I think, to what I read to you at the start where Jesus says, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. You know what I mean. When I'm in a situation and I do something that's less than what people expected of me, when I say something that makes people question who I am, when, I, when people see me in a situation and they don't know what to think about that, I know what I want from people. I want people to give me the most gracious, generous explanation for my behavior. I want them to believe the best about me. I want them to think the best about me. And when they can't believe the best about me, I want them to come to me and ask me about it and talk to me about it and trust that I'm the kind of person that wants to make it right. Not talk about me to somebody else. Not believe the worst and criticize me. We show respect to other people by disciplining ourselves to believe the best. That's what I want. I bet you want the same exact thing. And as we begin to believe the best about each other, we will begin to bridge the divide that exists in our culture. Now, the truth is, I, when I first made this list, I came up with a bunch of other things that I, I really don't have time to talk to you about. And at this point, I, I think you already get the idea of how you go about showing respect. You could probably come up with your own list from here. But I did have one more that I thought, particularly for our culture, I needed to say out loud before I ended. Respectful people refuse to label other people they disagree with, and they don't intentionally use divisive words to make their point. Proverbs 51 is probably a verse that most of us can memorize. A, a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words will make tempers flare. I think of a part of what has hurt so many of us in this recent growing tension in our culture is to sit back and watch family and friends who throw out divisive, hurtful, outright, I mean, wrong kinds of phrases to use about family and friends. And they do it in a way, they, it's amazing to me that they say this about people that they say that they love. And to be honest, it happens on both sides of the divide. We all know that when you label somebody racist or un-American or liberal snowflake or Nazi, we all know that those are not words that anybody's using to try to bring people closer. Those words are intentionally meant to divide. They're intentionally meant to anger. So people who are serious about showing respect to everyone always decide at some point, there's some words and phrases I'm just not going to use. There are some words, no matter how much the anger in me rises, I'm just not going to say. They don't do it in the name of being politically correct. They do it in the name because they're followers of Jesus. And our leader told us that we were to love each other. We realize that there are words and phrases that are so incredibly divisive and so disrespectful that the words themselves hurt people and they shut down discussion and they move nothing forward. We decide we're going to use our words differently and we just won't say those things to each other. And by the way, I, I'm including that we won't type them and write them on social media, which has become the battleground for a lot of our war. I mean, this divide that goes on in our culture these days. 
If we're going to be the light in a dark place, if we're going to be a city on a, sil- on a hill, set on a hill that will bring light to the whole place, if the church is going to help lead the way in bridging the divide in our culture, I, your, I urge you followers of Christ in all our discussions, spoken, written, social media, that we remove words that do nothing but incite anger and divide people. We use our words to bridge the divide and show respect. I'm not saying you don't engage. I think followers of Christ need to engage. And I don't really care which of your opinions you hold. I think you need to engage, but we need to engage differently. We need to show respect to everyone always. Now, here's what I want to do as we close out this first message. First, I want to really urge you to come back and be a part of this series. I th- I think there's going to be something for all of us to learn. Even if you're not in this current divide thing, many of us have relational divides that you need to be at work bridging. And secondly, I want to urge you to get into a small group where you can talk about this. And tonight, the group link is happening. And maybe you're in a place where you've never been in a group. Group link would be where you need to come. Or maybe you've decided, I want to get out of the group that I've been in where I already know everybody's opinion, and I think they all agree with me, and I'm going to take a chance to go out and I'm going to practice showing respect to people I disagree with. I'm going to take a chance that I would be in a small group and I'd have a chance to actually practice showing respect to everyone always. I'd urge you to come to Group Link tonight and maybe find a different group to be in. But here's how I want to urge all of us to end this with me. I want you to look at this list that that I just gave you about showing respect to everyone always. That we see people as image bearers and that we can learn to differ with people without demonizing and we give people the benefit of the doubt and we believe the best and that we don't use any incendiary words and we don't label people. As you you scroll through that list, as, as I was talking through that list, Was there any one of them or more that you felt a little nudge? Maybe the Spirit said something to you that that's the one for you? Which one of these would your family say that you need to work on? Would you be willing to have a conversation with somebody who would tell you the truth, not just seek to build you up, but they would love you enough that they would tell you the truth about which one of these you need to change? For extra credit, would you be willing to talk to somebody you know differs with you and ask them which of these that you need to change? so that you can show respect to everyone always. And then when they tell you, ask God to help you change so that you can be a part of bridging the divide by showing respect to everyone always. Let me pray for us as we do this. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus and thank you for your great love for us that respects us and offers us grace and draws us to yourself. Thank you that in spite of all the things that we've done that are different than what you want us to do, you bridged the divide and you came to us. Now, Father, I pray for followers of Christ that you would help us to be the first one to step across this divide, that we would be the light of the world that you designed us to be, a city set on the hill, that we give light to the whole place. Help us to be people that show respect to everyone always. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.